Good morning, this is Angela with Parkos Permaculture. I am hiding in the shade of my hardy kiwi here in the backyard of my permaculture garden in zone 8B. My ducks and chickens may be a little upset in this video off and on. There is a new cat in the neighborhood that has been coming around the last couple of days and they don't know him yet. And so they go on high alert every time he comes around. Yep, there they go. So I wanted to take a few moments here and give you an update on how things are looking in the garden this first week of June. Now it's been a little bit of a weird year so far. It has been hot early and then we had cold rainy weather and some of the blooming of some of my plants and the fruit set has been disrupted by the weird weather. However, my hardy kiwi is just now blooming. And that means it's kind of a safe time. There's an abundance of bees out. I'm hoping to get really good fruit set for my hardy kiwi. This is Dumbarton Oaks, and you can see she's a big girl. So let me show you what the blooms look like and what I'm hoping for and kind of what the next steps are with this kiwi. And then I wanna show you around a few other parts of the garden. So my female hardy kiwi grows up and over my woodshed here where I keep my store of wood for the winter. You can see she's so large that even though I've already pruned her once this spring, she's coming in through the back of the woodshed. And I say she because these are the female flowers here. There are a few types of hardy kiwi that only require one, but Dumbarton Oaks and many of the other varieties I really like all require a female and a male. You can see here, I'm starting to get fruit set. These are the little tiny baby kiwis. Now this is a hardy kiwi, so they'll only be about this big when they're ripe. My next steps here, after the fruit is set, and it looks like so far it's gonna be just a huge crop, my next steps are gonna be to cut back some of these extras. Kiwi can grow a foot a day sometimes if they're really happy. And these laterals here can shade the developing fruit and slow ripening. I've had problems in the past with competition from squirrels right as the fruit is getting ripe. So this year I'm gonna try and devise a plan to get more of the harvest for me and less of it going to the squirrels. Maybe there will be enough to evenly share this year. I try to overplant everything so that a percentage can go to wildlife. There's another baby, you can see two babies there. Good pollination so far. This was covered in bees this morning. Let me go show you what the male looks like. The male is just across the way. This is my contorted mulberry, which I've been pruning heavily the last few days, which has set my allergies off like you would not believe. And back here is the male. I keep him pruned smaller, although he tends to be more aggressive. You can see he's kind of strangling one of my plums here. I'm really tempted to move this plum. As the garden has evolved, this area has gotten quite shady and my plum here has struggled. However, my currants, white, these are white currants, by the way, which are more shade tolerant, are doing great. Over here, we're still, hey hubby. Hi. We're still working on getting the rain barrel system set up. We have ordered a downspout uh, kit from the internet and we're gonna get those four rain barrels going really soon. Right now, Casey is working on fixing the uh, spigot itself for the side of the garden. Our house was a fixer upper when we got it and some of the fixer upping that was done by previous owners was not so good. So we're always finding things that were not done appropriately and uh, having to come back in and fix things up. This is a thalictrum, which has decided to go crazy. It is probably five feet tall and has fallen over. I'm just picking it up out of my way. <clears throat> Goals for this early part of quote unquote summer are to get some progress done with the outdoor kitchen and to finish my greenhouse. You may have noticed I have not completed getting the greenhouse windows in yet. Each of them needs two to three coats of good quality exterior paint. And that is a slow process if I'm gonna do it well. You can see that my annual garden beds are all planted out for now. Bush beans, tomatillos, I've got cantaloupe, I've got um, lots of tomatoes. I use tomato cages. I just don't have the time to patiently train my tomatoes. So I use tomato cages, lots of pumpkins. My cucumbers from a previous video are doing well. 
You can see here some of my comfrey has fallen over. When it starts to flop over and you can see the blossoms are pretty much done. This is sterile comfrey, by the way. We're down to the blossoms at the very end. When this is done with its first bloom cycle, I cut it back to the ground. You can see here a comfrey that I cut back a couple of days ago and I use that all as mulch along with dog hair and along with chop and drop. Yeah. At this point in the garden season, my asparagus has all gone to fern. If you've not grown asparagus before, you might not be aware this is what it looks like. Uh, as the season goes on, we're letting it go to fern and then it can regenerate the roots and the crown down there. And that's how you keep asparagus going for 20 something years. I also have my conquered grapes behind it. And I neglected to prune these adequately. I did some hacking back of my conquered grape. Oh, pumpkin volunteer right here. We'll see how that turns out. My peonies are finishing. They're getting toward the end of their life here. This first flush of peonies. I always call these fried egg peonies, but I don't really know what the name of them is. I got them from my neighbors, Ben and Allie. So if we look at the grapes here, I didn't do a good job of pruning them and they're really overgrown, but holy cow, I think it's gonna be a good grape year. Loads and loads and loads of grapes. Grapes are wind pollinated, by the way. So you wanna make sure there's good air circulation so that you get good fruit set. Concord grapes have that wonderful foxy flavor to them. My grandpa grew them in his garden in Indiana and I grow them as an homage to him. They are my favorite grape. Along with that, the mulberries have set. I have a video about this Illinois everbearing mulberry. Gonna be a good year for mulberries. I think mulberries are probably my most consistent producer. If you can see, this is mulberry branches absolutely laden with fruit, laden. We have one three gallon container in the freezer left of mulberries from last year. We've been eating them all winter. Lots of cobbler and pie for us. So you may have seen my recent video where I was sitting down here working on spinning in the morning. This is a really lovely location to sit and work on handwork. And it's one of my favorite spots in the garden this time of year because behind it is my beloved Jude the Obscure Rose. I got some flack in some videos where I talked about planting natives and not being dogmatic and feeling like you can only plant natives and you can't use those other kind of traditional cottage garden flowers or you can't use cultivars. Yes, a heavily ruffled, deeply petaled rose like Jude the Obscure is not gonna allow easy access for pollinators. It's not a great pollinator food, but you know what? It gets me out in the garden and I enjoy it tremendously. So I appreciate folks who, who felt comfortable sharing their feedback and their opinion about growing natives versus non-natives. We might not agree, that's okay. It takes a diversity of people to do permaculture and not all permaculture gardens are gonna look the same. And for me, Having that mix of cottage garden flowers is so important for my own personal engagement and enjoyment of the garden. I'll also point out here, walk in this way. I have plenty of roses in the garden that are simple, open-faced roses that have tons of access for pollinators. So these are covered with bees. I make sure that while Jude down here may not be a great a source of food for pollinators, that doesn't mean that I have a dearth of food for pollinators. It means I have a ton of other things that I use to compensate. That's called good permaculture design, right? We wanna try and make sure that we plan for all of those different elements. Yes, stack functions where you can. If you can get your pollinator food and your flower enjoyment all in one, in one easy, simple, open flower, that's great. But if you also really enjoy those cottage garden flowers, that's great too. So we're just on the other side of the fence now from the Jude the Obscure Rose and you walk through the gate. I think I've mentioned this before. You walk smack dab into a medlar. Always sets tons of fruit. The fading blossoms have this beautiful pink tone. They start out white, but even the fading blossoms are really lovely. Medlar sets way more fruit than we can ever use. Highly productive self-fertile tree, ancient food crop. This was not originally where the gate was. This gate made out of free stuff. 
originally wasn't here. So this wasn't our initial entrance point into this part of the garden. And that means this tree is no longer ideally situated, but I don't move it. You just have to make sure you don't bang your head as you go through. We're in the poultry run now. So you can see there isn't really much underplanted because this is the area that was full of weeds. And I've put the poultry in here so they could strip all the weeds and bugs and weed seeds out. And I've thrown lots of chop and drop. I had some mulberry prunings so they could eat the leaves, etc., etc. Here's Jude from this side of the fence. The blossoms are a little faded in the sun. And right next to Jude over here is my seckle pear. I have to be really careful I don't snag my shirt as I go through. So on the other side, again, Jude from this angle, seckle pear gonna be a great year for pears. I think if you can only grow one pear tree in your garden, this is a good pick. Very resistant to fire blight. Sets large crops of very, very sweet dessert pears. Great, great plant. I do have to come back. I have been um, doing some summer pruning of both my apples and my pears. You can see these large upright shoots. They won't form spurs on pears. So I come in and I snap them off and get rid of them. I do a lot of summer pruning because I need to keep my trees small. Speaking of which, it is time for me to prune my Shropshire Damson, the same thing. All of the fruit is way down in here. I have all of these long, lanky shoots that come out here in the late spring when the weather's good and I'll need to take all of this back. You can see my figs here had a lot of damage in the winter. This is why I always kind of prune my figs a little bit too big. And I know I owe you all a fig pruning video, but sometimes if we have horrifically harsh winter weather, we get branches that die and I need to come in and prune those out. One thing I want to say is that I try to think about what my garden looks like from every angle and having not only the functionality of the garden really strong and robust, but also thinking about the visual impact. So no matter where you're standing in the garden, I wanna have those stacks of layers, right? Building back and giving that sense of forced perspective and beauty. And I feel like for me, again, it makes it so I want to be out in the garden more. No matter where I'm standing, I can pause, I can look around and it just feels lush and gorgeous and exactly how I want it. A little bit wild, a little bit overgrown, with those notes of careful cultivation. The rain garden is looking really good. I did wanna add that this is the mating season and the season during which moles are raising babies. So you might see a lot more mole activity late May through June for us is kind of the peak of the mole activity. And you can see their tunnels around the garden. Cecile Brunner is done. It's time to come in and deadhead. Lazy deadheading, I have a video on that. Works great for removing those browning blossoms. Quite enjoyable. Cecile isn't gonna give me any rose hips, by the way. Not useful ones anyway. And she will need a big prune soon. Cecile is such a great early rose, but she gets a little unruly because she's a rambler. She's almost too big for this spot. I almost need a big tree to kind of run her up and over instead of this little arch. So now I have to carefully go in here. See, this is a new shoot. Do not want to walk right into that. Okay, stuck in here. So now we're entering into a part of the garden that is in process getting some repairs done on it. So this is my golden raspberry patch down here. You can see I've put down mulch that needs to be spread. You can see volunteer pumpkins. Always leave the volunteers, even if I think they don't turn out that great. Um, they make good food for the poultry. Here is my hazel that's been coppiced and needs to be coppiced some more. This is the size, about diameter I choose when I coppice. Makes good firewood. I know I said I was gonna do a whole garden tour, but I think we're gonna stop here. Having only done a section of the backyard, I owe y'all more from the front yard, but it's too hot and sunny and this video is getting a little long. So next time maybe we'll do that or maybe the time after. Here I have my Rosa Rugosa. Oh, you can see there's a little bee in it. Hello, little friend. Little 
little tiny bee. Rosa rugosa is the rose that I grow for those big hips to make rose hip syrup and jelly. Behind it, I have my sea buckthorns. I have two females and a male. Again, you can see the mulberry, which I really need to come and take this big piece down. It's too big. I do pollard this mulberry, but even so, it sends up some huge branches. Again, I'm looking at those layers that I'm stacking up here. I don't have a very big garden. I work on that forced perspective so that I try and draw in my neighbor's trees into the view that you're getting. And I also am aware that the taller plants need to go to the back, not only for the view, but also so that the sun can hit these lower growing plants in the middle, right? The sun comes in this way across the garden. Tall plants on the sides, like here, and the shorter plants in the middle. That makes a sun trap garden. Thanks so much for watching today. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you are enjoying June in your garden, be it a permaculture garden or a cottage garden or a mishmash like mine. Please don't forget to click like and subscribe. That is the best way that you can support the work that I'm doing here. If you have questions, feel free to drop them down below. I try to get to questions in the comments, but even if I can't answer you directly, I keep a running list so that I can hopefully address your question in a video in the future. If you like the work that I'm doing and you wanna throw a couple of bucks at me, there is the thanks button on YouTube. I also have a Patreon and a PayPal you can check out down below. Thanks so much.